specifically for a property management company, like you, you want them to bring in quality owner relationships in the realm of, of what we are, are talking about, um, on, on this podcast is, you know, if you want your salesperson to be doing more outbound, or if you want them to be bringing in owners that have multiple doors instead of one doors, you need to incentivize them to focus on that activity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, if their compensation and the ways that you're rewarding them are not aligned with what you ultimately want them to be doing, then it's going to be, you know, it's going to be hard to expect them to follow through on it. Welcome back to another episode of Grow Outbound. I am joined as always with my co-host, Ben Smith. Ben, how you doing? Now you're back in North Carolina. We are remote. How is it going, my friend? You know, I'm doing great. It's it's back. It's great to be back in North Carolina. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the pollen has arrived here. Uh, so I am a little bit congested. Uh, folks, that live here in the South know a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I can't complain much. So doing well. What about you? But I'm doing fantastic. It almost feels like more pressure to do the podcast from home. I don't know about you, but mm. it's like everything is not just staged. We had to like on purpose get ready for the podcast today. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I, it's funny. I have all this really nice audio visual equipment in my, in my office now and uh, quite a few empty boxes that need to be broken down that uh, my wife is eager for that to happen. So uh, I do feel, I, you know, this, I feel a lot more official uh, with this nice microphone and the headphones and all that stuff. So. But what's positive is none of the boxes are in camera frame. So you're good. That's, <laughs> that's, it doesn't yeah, matter. No, I, it's not in frame. Yeah. It doesn't exist. That's right. Yeah. If you if you were to look to my right, uh, you would see quite a mess. Um, that's okay. Maybe that's that's sort of an analogy for life, right? Like what you see here, it's all clean and uh, clutter free, yeah. but just outside of your vantage point, it's a total disaster. So, all right. Uh, so to kick it. us off today, Ben, I have a question that I want to ask you. You ready? I, I think so. All right. And for you listening to this podcast, this is a good one for you to ponder on as well. What is something that you have recently changed your mind on? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know uh, how significant this is. I actually know how, how you feel about this subject. So I, I think for a long time was really consistent about typed notes. Like mm. if I'm sitting, having a conversation with someone and I'm taking notes, I'm typically typing them out into a document or directly into HubSpot, which is our CRM. And I've actually come around on going back to handwriting notes. And I don't know. I mean, there, there's sort of a disorganization to it, like on the paper, but like in the moment having a conversation, it feels much more natural to be writing rather than typing something out. Um, I don't, I, I still haven't quite cracked the code on how to be more organized about it. I have a, like the pad I use is like one where you, you know, kind of tear off the, the piece of paper that's been used. And so like, I have like a stack of those papers that there's probably stuff that needs to get somewhere that hasn't gotten there yet. But just from like an uh, experience and feel standpoint, I'm, I'm kind of back in on handwriting um, chicken, chicken scratch notes, uh, during my calls. So I'll, I'll turn that, that question around on you, Kristen. Uh, what's something that you have recently changed your mind on? First, I want to say that I love writing my notes by hand. I will remember it almost 80% of the time. If I write it down, if I type it, maybe 20% I'll remember, but I love handwriting notes. But as you were saying that, I just had a great idea that I just ripped the page off and throw it away once I put it into my CRM. I had never thought of that and that that's such a great idea. I just 
in my brain now. Thank glad, you. Glad I, glad I could help with my uh, <laughs> with my answer there. <laughs> <laughs> for for me, it is on the view of audiobooks. I had a hard stance in my head that if I was listening to an audiobook, it didn't actually count as reading the book. And I would go so far as to like double purchase books where I would listen to it and then I would buy it after. So then I could have like the trophy on the shelf of, I read that book. But now that I've switched over to listening to audiobooks more, I'm like, it's the same thing, Kristen. What what was wrong with you? Like you, you are reading books, you are getting through the material. It definitely counts as, as finishing a book. For some reason, I felt like it was less than. It wasn't mm. the same as physically reading the book. So that has, I've changed my mind on that. And I have allowed audiobooks to be counted in my brain as as change or as as completed yeah that's really interesting i i have been an audiobook person for a couple years now and um i think i think the challenge i have is in the the retention uh Mm -hmm. of what i'm listening to um yeah it's i definitely don't feel like i'm remembering as much or taking as much of it to heart but in terms of just like being effective and you know it's it's easy for me to listen to something while i'm driving or completing a task maybe that's part of the issue is that i'm doing other things while i'm listening to the book but i mean are you do you feel like you're able to retain information pretty well by listening to a audiobook uh, for some some parts, if it's something that I really want to be intentional about, I will just buy the book and just read it. Um, however, I found that I really enjoy audiobooks that are read by the author because I feel like whenever the author is reading the book, they tend to emphasize really points that they think are important. And it's very much just like my interpretation of it. But I feel like they put emphasis on things that they're really proud of. Uh, And so I like listening to authors narrate their audiobooks because it's just a different, I don't know, it's almost like I can have a conversation, a one-way conversation with the author of a book. So there's some books that I do like to listen to, like, um, oh my goodness, can't remember the, the name of the books, uh, but it's Who Not How and mm. um, The Gap in the Gain. I want to say his name is Dan Sullivan, but okay. that may not be the right name. But anyways, whenever he reads the book, he does like a little uh, like conversation in the middle of, I'm sorry, Benjamin Hardy is the name of yeah. the, the author there. No, it's Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. There we go. I was right. They read it together. (laughs) And then in between the chapters, they have conversations over what they just talked about. And to me, I'm like, this is the epitome of listening to this book. So for me, it's who reads it. Long story short there. It's who reads the audiobook to me that I think makes the difference. Yeah. The, uh, as you were saying that the example that comes to mind for me is, uh, did you ever listen to green lights by Matthew McConaughey? No. Uh, it's like the quintessential audiobook to listen to where the author is narrating because it's his voice and like all of his well, like mannerisms. And I mean, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's I'll, so good. I'll report back to you, Ben. I'm going to get it right now and I will report back to you uh, once I have yeah. completed that book. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it, you're basically listening to McConaughey telling stories. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. So. I, uh, it there's, doesn't. There's it our, doesn't. Uh, maybe we'll do a segment, audio book of the week uh, that we recommend to people. Well, that's good. This week it's green lights. <laughs> uh, so to bring us full circle there, the, the reason that I wanted to ask you that question of what's something you recently changed your mind on is because in today's uh, podcast here, we're going to be talking about sales culture. And I think that sales culture and culture in companies in general is something that is maybe considered like a new age idea. People have strong feelings one way or the other. Either they want to build a really strong culture or they're like, culture doesn't actually matter. And it's just show up to work, get your paycheck, and that's it. Um, So we're going to challenge some people today. I think as we continue to talk about sales culture and culture in general, So I felt like leading off with that question was really good so that you as the listener can start to put yourself in the mind frame of, should I change my mind? Maybe I should think about this again. So to to kick us off here on sales culture, Ben, what is it? 
what at at its basic level, what is a sales culture? Yeah, that's that's such a good question. I, I feel like culture in terms of the corporate speak is it's sort of a, a buzzword these days. Um, a lot of startup companies, you know, this idea of being a part of a great culture is something that I think most people job seeking would say, as well as, you know, at the corporate level would say, oh yeah, we have a, a great culture. And you know, to me, that means the environment that you are creating and curating for uh, the people on your team, the experience that your employees are having. And at, at a very basic level, what I think that a lot of times entails is like, hey, we've got this great set of core values and we have a, a ping pong table in the office. Uh, <laughs> you know, those things are great. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot more that goes into it. And, and as we talk about sales culture, it's specifically, I think it's even a little bit deeper than the uh, overall company experience. It's what do, what do you as a, a sales group organization value? Um, what are the things that you're really committed to doing uh, as a team? Um, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of things that that are pieces of the puzzles. It's not just the core values that live on your website. Um, it's what are you committed to? Like what what is the environment for our salespeople like? Uh, because the reality is, is that, you know, it, it, to your point, it'd be simple to say like, yeah, you know, we we provide good pay uh, and we have a time off policy and it's fun to work here, but at the at the end of the day, you know, salespeople want to be challenged and they want mm -hmm. to. Um, th there are particular things that are valuable to salespeople uh, that they that they want to be a part of, and so it, it's kind of a tricky to me. It's a tricky thing to define because there are several aspects to it. But I, I hope that today we can kind of give people a starting point on some of the things that that they should be thinking about as it relates to creating a great sales culture. So Ben, whenever it comes then to, to sales culture, if somebody doesn't necessarily have one, right, or if they don't have a defined sales culture, how important is it to define it? Is this something that you need to write down on paper? Is this something you need to present and have written and posted on your wall? Is it something that evolves naturally? Like, What are your thoughts there on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's multiple aspects to it. You know, the first is... Um, sort of what comes from the leadership level, right? Like there are things as a leader uh, that you want to sort of be guiding uh, in terms of creating a sales culture. And, you know, I think in, in property management companies, typically the sales team might be relatively small. Um, you know, you may have one or two BDMs or some remote team members that are a part of the sales organization. And so I think, you know, there is a leadership level um, thought that needs to go into this as far as, you know, some very basic things like how do we incentivize our salespeople? What are our goals and how are we going to create the best environment for people to reach the company goals, but also their individual goals? And then another part of it is um, sort of created at the ground floor, right? Um, one of the things that, uh, I, I got to be a part of at my previous company is, is we, we had a sales credo that was separate from kind of the company's core values. And we, as a group created that ourselves, we sat in a room as peers and said, these are the things that we're committed to as a group of, uh, sales professionals within our company. It wasn't like thrust upon us, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. a, Hey, here's what's important to us as a group of salespeople. And it's like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, you're just kind of being told that. But when you, when you co-create that with the other people within the organization, what I found is that there's a lot more buy-in because mm -hmm. we, we have said, yes, these are the things that are important to us. And, and ultimately continuing to revisit those things. Uh, over time and, and even even maybe change some things over time as far as what those what those commitments are. So I think it's it, I think it's both. It's it's a leadership level thing as well as a you know team co-creation of of the culture itself. And a lot of a lot of it too comes down to the the people that you hire too, right? Because um, 
you know, you want to hire people that are aligned with your values and, and have the, the traits as salespeople um, and as just people in general that you would want to be working with uh, on a daily basis. Yeah, that that makes a lot of a lot a lot of sense. And so whenever we I want to go back to a point that you just had there and that is how do we incentivize individual goals and company goals? Like those are the three points mm. there that you brought up whenever we are starting to create the sales culture at a company level. Um and so whenever we go in how do we incentivize what are your thoughts on that? Like, how do you appropriately incentivize a salesperson? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I don't, I don't think that there is really one perfect answer for this. I think everyone's a little bit different in the way that they would go about it. But what I would say is that your incentives for your salespeople have to be aligned with what you want to accomplish as a company but also with the activities that you want them to do on a daily basis. Um, and I think, you know, obviously the obvious answer is, um, you know, closing deals and bringing in business. I mean, that's the very obvious answer, but, you know, specifically for a property management company, like you, you want them to bring in quality owner relationships, folks that, you know, the operations team is going to be, happy to manage for. Um, and so I think you just have to get really clear on what it is you want your salesperson to be doing, um, what's expected of them. Uh, I think in, in the realm of, of what we are, are talking about, um, on, on this podcast is, you know, if you want your salesperson to be doing more outbound, or if you want them to be bringing in owners that have multiple doors instead of one door, you need to incentivize them to focus on that activity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, if their compensation and the ways that you're rewarding them are not aligned with what you ultimately want them to be doing, then it's going to be, you know, it's going to be hard to expect them to follow through on it. And so I, I think there's a number of different ways th that you can handle it, but ultimately, think about what your end goal is. Um, right. If your end goal is like, hey, I want you to bring in 20 doors a month and I don't really care how you get there, right? I'm fine mm -hmm. if it's 20 owners and 20 doors. Um, like, great. Like, that that's perfectly acceptable. But if as a company you have uh, more specific goals, hey, I want to bring in 20, I want my BDM to bring in 20 doors a month, but I want them to focus on people that have portfolios rather right. than individual properties. That's that's kind of the easy example that comes to mind for me. All right, well, how are you going to how are you going to incentivize them to follow through on that activity? Um because at the end of the day, if it's if it's just very broad, um then you can expect broad results probably. So, I hopefully that's yes. a good answer. I'd be I'd be curious your thoughts on this obviously having coached BDMs and probably yeah. gotten feedback from folks about about how uh, different companies structure their their incentives. What what you said there at the end is, um, you know, it, basically it boils down to incentivizing the results that you want to see. If you want your BDM to be focusing on outbound, well, then incentivize outbound more than inbound. As salespeople, we're naturally going to go where the money is because that's why yeah. we're in sales. If we work harder, we make more money. And that's the draw to, to being in sales. So incentivizing the activity that you want to see, I think is huge in building that culture that your salesperson wants to be in. Because right now, salespeople, if you're a good salesperson, you could essentially work anywhere. So having mm -hmm. a sales culture is important for retaining that BDM. Because over the last couple of years, Ben, I, I think that I've coached, I don't know, a couple hundred BDMs in that time. And that seems like a big number. And that's for, you know, a couple hundred property management companies. But within those companies, I've seen a high turnover rate for business mm -hmm. development managers where they come in and they stay and then they leave because there's something that's missing. And what I have identified, and I don't have the the statistics behind this, this is my observation here, is the companies that have put time, energy, and effort into thinking about their sales cultures and how they want their salespeople 
to experience work and experience working with their companies are the ones that retain their BDMs longer. The companies who say, hey, show up and I want you to be here and I want your butt in a seat for eight hours a day because that is what I am paying you and uh, you know, very strict conditions there. Mm. Uh, those salespeople don't tend to stay as long because that salesperson was expecting something else. So I think that any sales culture, if that is what you want, if you want your BDM to be have their butt in the seat for eight hours a day because that is what you are expecting, you need to know that before you start hiring a salesperson because you need to hire the right salesperson. What tends to happen is um, we have an idealistic image of what we want a salesperson to do, but we haven't sat back and actually thought about like you're saying, Ben, what do we want from our company? What are our company goals? What do we want our BDM to be focused on? And I really think that that has to come before you start to hire salespeople and really your expectations of what you're looking for. Because any any sales culture is a good sales culture, if you have one. If you don't put any effort into it, you're not going to be able to retain a business development manager. Did any of that resonate with you, yeah. Ben? No, it, it, a lot of what you said, uh, there's probably several different directions I could go. What, what immediately came to mind is based on what you said is like, just even the basics of, do you want somebody that's going to work 50 hours a week or do you want someone that is going to blow their sales goals out of the water? Those are two different questions. If you want someone that's going to blow their sales goals out of the water, they might work 25 hours. You know what I mean? Like it, part of what's great about being in sales is having the flexibility to right. set out, you know, we're typically very driven, self-motivated people that are in sales. And so, yeah, like if your expectation is I want them to be sitting in front of the computer all day or working X amount of hours, like then you're not, um, you're not incentivizing them the correct way, or you're not having the mm -hmm. correct level of expectation. Um, and, and I do think that that can go back to how you, you structure compensation, for instance, like you would be able to speak better to this than I would, but that whole question of base pay versus commission, right? You want your salesperson to have some sort of base, uh, salary or, or hourly rate with you so that they're mm -hmm. not worried about starving, right? Like right. fear is fear is not a great motivator. Uh, I've done commission only sales before. I think you have as well. Like mm -hmm. it's tough, but at the same time, you don't want to so heavily compensate on base salary that their results ultimately don't matter that much, right? If I know that right. all, I, you know, 90% of what I get paid is, is coming to me no matter what, then I'm not going to be as hungry to go out and, and get after it. So I, I think there are, there's questions like that, that, you know, as an owner, you would want to ask yourself to your point before you're bringing somebody in. I, I think another interesting point that you touched on is, um, alignment to the, the company goals and, you know, oftentimes ask property management company owners, Hey, what are your goals for this year? And usually there's some mm -hmm. aspect of growth to it, right? Like, sure we want to add X amount of doors or maybe it's profit growth. It's not, it's not door growth. But the other one that comes up all the time is like efficiency or, you know, yeah. process related. We want, we want better process. We want to be more efficient. And for your salesperson and bringing in, um, you know, ha bringing in doors, like to me, that means, Hey, we want to bring in quality doors. We want to bring in quality right. owner relationships because ultimately what can happen is if if a salesperson is just bringing in anything and everything and it's not aligned with what the operations team is really wanting, um, then a lot of things can go awry, right? It's, mm -hmm. Especially from a culture standpoint. Like you walk into the office and everyone's like shaking their head at you because you just brought in another landlord that is not somebody that fits the profile of what we want to manage, right? And so mm -hmm. th there's there's two sides, right? Like the salesperson needs to be aligned with okay, I'm going to bring in quality doors because I know we're going to be able to handle it. They're going to be long-term relationships and it's not, it's not going to put a strain on the team. Yeah. For the folks in operations, it's 
I want to be able to celebrate the success of the salesperson because what mm -hmm. they're bringing is stuff that we want to manage. It's really hard yes. to celebrate success when what's, what, what's coming in is not great. Uh, like, I think there will always be that tension of kind of sales and ops because ultimately growth means more work or, or it means um, additional work for, for the team. But, right. you know, if everyone understands what we're trying to do at a corporate level, why we have a growth, we're not, we're not just growing for the sake of growing. We're growing for a reason. Um, and right. there are, uh, you know, it's, I've talked to some really great folks in the industry that I admire a ton that will say things like, we want to grow because we want to provide more opportunities for people on our team. Like, right. If we're a larger organization, then now all of a sudden there's upward mobility for the people on my team. We're not just setting a growth goal because I want to make more money as an owner, right? Like good luck yeah. getting buy on that. So I'm curious if anything uh, I said uh, <laughs> resonated with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that there's, there's a lot of things there. I love this episode, by the way, like this is, this is a good one. Me too. This is great. Um, be, because um, really setting up the role for your salesperson is so dependent on the rest of your team. And there does have to be this cross between your company culture helping to define your sales culture. Because yes, even in the best companies, there is always tension between sales and ops. No matter what, there is tension between sales and ops. I have yet to see a company where everything is perfect because you're right. Uh, whenever a BDM brings in a new door, the property managers, client success managers, whatever they're called, have to do more work. They have to. Like it, It's just the way that, that it works. And so um, as, as we're doing as we're thinking about building a sales team and we're thinking about bringing on a BDM, it's important that the whole company is bought in on success and why we're succeeding. Because you're right, Ben, if it's focused just only on the owner wanting to, to make more money, there's not a lot of buy-in there for that. Yeah. But for the reasons why we want to grow, I think helps to get buy-in from the entire team. Because if we're all working towards the same vision, it's easier to get there, right? If we think about a rowboat analogy, if we're all rowing in the correct way, we're going to get where we need to go faster. If just one person is off, we may end up going in circles. And I've seen a lot of property management companies in that way where because of compensation, the BDM is just selling what they have to sell because they need to survive, right? And so that goes into are we going to pay a salary or are we going to go commission only? In my experience, I've seen in the companies that are paying commission only, there isn't a thought to, is this going to be a good property? It's just, I got to yeah. feed myself. I've got to feed my family. So I don't really care what this does to the rest of the company because I need to make money. And in the property management world, that's not necessarily the best place you want your salesperson to be mentally. You want your salesperson to have buy-in to the whole team and respect for where we're trying to go. And paying a salary buys that, right? It buys the mm -hmm. buy-in from the salesperson because now I'm obligated to this company. I have, um, you know, a responsibility to help grow this in the right way. And so whenever it comes down to compensation, I think that that's one of the biggest things that needs to be considered here in how you want to grow, right? Do you just want every single door? If you do, that's fantastic. Then maybe you already know that comp should be all all commission and nothing else, but what's that going to do to the team down mm. the line? And so, Ben, I want to ask you a question because the company that you were working at before, I mean, whenever I look at it, it looks like it's just absolutely fantastic place to be a salesperson, right? I mean, it everyone just seems so unified and rallied together and working towards common goals, but I have to imagine it wasn't always like that, or maybe it was. Um, and you were on the forefront of that, if I remember correctly from our conversation. You were one of you know the first few handful of people. How did you see that progression go from the front lines of being one of the first salespeople to having, I don't know, dozens of salespeople at the company? Like what what did that progression look like? And were there any key changes that were made along the way? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um I think when I when I came on board, 
with my previous company, you know, roughly four and a half years ago. Uh, I actually, my first day was a, a team meeting ever, you know, we had folks all over the country, but everybody was, was in Raleigh, North Carolina for this meeting. And, you know, there were 18 of us in a, in a boardroom, uh, a large conference room. And, uh, right before I left, we had our annual sales kickoff, which there were like 80 people at. So there are a lot of things that are challenging about that because you do want to you do want to maintain the culture. You want it to improve. You definitely don't want it to stay, take a step back, right? Um, if you have a good thing going, you want it to continue to develop and and shape over time. And I think there's a few things that I could point to. Like the the first is just is leadership, right? Like having strong leaders who are able to tell the story and get the buy-in from the team and obviously think strategically about um, this stuff. Uh, it, it does it does matter. There's a lot of co-creation that happens, but at, at a starting point, like if you don't have good leadership, then, then it, it can be a challenge. Um, and really having that vision to say like, hey, not only do we value the culture that we have, but we want to figure out how to maintain it as we grow. So mm-hmm. that that is definitely a factor. Like there is an element of vision that has to exist um, in order to be able to withstand growth at that rate of, of a company. Um, I, I think another factor too that kind of ties into leadership is, um, is just recruiting and hiring. Like right. I think most people would say that that's, that that's a tough thing to do in general. It's mm-hmm. hard to find good talent. But one of the things that we always focused on was hiring for culture. Um, You know, what that can look like is one, we we hired a lot of people that we already knew pretty well. So they were a referral of of a current employee or they were somebody that was in the industry that we knew pretty well. Like having that baseline starting point of like, hey, I know this is a great person. Mm -hmm. Um, That is super important. And there may be, skills that that person doesn't have or experience that that person doesn't have. But ultimately, if you're hiring for culture and you're looking for certain traits of the person that you're hiring, to me, one of the most important ones is teachability. And so if I'm talking to someone that, you know, maybe they don't have, maybe their resume doesn't look as good as another resume, but I can tell that they're hungry, they want to learn and they want to grow. Like that, I'll take that 10 times out of 10 in sales because ultimately um, you want somebody that is willing to learn um, and isn't going to be um, not going to come in thinking they know it all or be expected Mm -hmm. to know it all. So those are some of the things that that really come to mind. The the other thing uh, that I, I think is really important is just like having fun and celebrating right. success. Like those, those are so huge. And, uh, you know, I'm not, again, back to my, my example at the beginning. It's, it's a funny example because uh, the company also did have this, but like the ping pong table in the office, like mm-hmm. we did have that. That was fun. But like, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about right. is like celebrating uh, people, celebrating success, taking time to do fun things together, um, things that are going to connect people together better. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're all here to do a job. And mm-hmm. if if I have gotten to know the people on my team, and I know them personally, I know their story, and I know about their family and what their goals are, like my buy-in to helping them be successful is so much greater. And, and that's really hard to do in this zoom world that we're in. Now, right. Right. Like when I started, we were going into an office every day and there were some people that were, were remote, but a lot of us were in the office. And so you have to find creative ways to continue to bring people together, to mm-hmm. have fun together. And ultimately, um, ultimately back to what I mentioned before about hiring, just like h- hiring people that are like-minded and, and they, they want to go, they want to grow personally. They want to grow professionally. Um, I, I think that that really goes a long way. It's sort of a hard thing to quantify, but um, 
you know, look, look at, look at your own team and, and how mm -hmm. many, you know, what's the average tenure of, of people that have been on board? Like, that's something that you can sell to talent say, Hey, people, when they come here, they, they stick around for a while. And if that's not yeah. the case, maybe think about that. Like, all right, well, why, why aren't people sticking around? Uh, you know, is there, yeah. is there something that I could be doing differently? So there's a, there's a good amount of self-reflection that you have to be willing to take. I think, uh, as you're, as you're considering company culture and, and sales culture for sure. Yeah, there, um, there's a really great company that I worked with out in um, Colorado. They cover quite a big area of Colorado. They have a dozen or so remote team members. They have people in the office. Like they're a huge company. And I think that they have a fantastic company culture and sales culture because they have – interwoven the two to where if the sales team is succeeding, the whole company is succeeding and they're working towards common goals and they are having, you know, different incentives. Can we get a certain number of reviews each month so we can bump up our star rating? Can we sell a certain number yeah. of doors this month to make sure that we're growing? Can we retain a certain number of doors? And all of those are tied to um, two things. One of them is money bonuses or time off. Like they say, mm, our team responds yep. to that. That is what they respond to. Either they get a half day off, a full day off, or they get a $50 bonus, a $100 bonus, whatever it is. But those are the two things that they have identified in their company that people respond to. So I think that as we're talking about that and, and having fun, sometimes it's just letting your employees go have fun on their own. It doesn't always yeah. have to be, I'm involved in their fun. It's what right. is my company respond to. And so I think that identifying that is very important as we're looking at these goals, because essentially with our cultures, we're motivating our people to work towards a common goal. And we're motivating our company to get us closer to the goal. And we have to inspire people to do that because we want people to have fun when they're coming to work. And fun can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. My, my first job that I had, we we had a number. I was on a residential team. So if we sold a certain number of houses every single month, we got to have a fun day. And these fun days ranged from, you know, going to an escape room to going to Six Flags for an entire day mm -hmm. or going to eat at a really expensive restaurant. And we and we picked all of the different things and, and we had metric goals. So if we hit our like just our metric, we got like a smaller fun day. If we hit our high goal, oh, we got to go out and have a blast and take an entire day and do something together because that's what we all liked to do. And we were all pushing forward and even like our operations people and our salespeople we wanted to work together because we wanted to go to Six Flags. Like we wanted to go and do these fun <laughs> things. And right. so to me, that is the importance of building that culture is it actually makes, I believe, people work harder. If they're excited to come into work every day and they're excited to all pull together with their coworkers in a common direction, it builds that camaraderie. It gets rid of a lot of the nasty office like politics and drama and things that go is going on if we're all working towards a common goal and once you start working towards a common goal it's really easy to see the people that don't fit and so sure. as um you know as i coached bdms Sometimes the BDMs were the problem. Sometimes they didn't want to work towards the common goal. Sometimes they didn't want to yeah. do it, or it was a director of operations, or it was a property manager. Because once you start all moving in a direction, the outliers become more obvious. And, you know, I think that trying to figure out how to say this delicately, you know, if somebody's not fitting <laughs> into the culture, they're not the right fit for the team. And that actually hurts the whole team because the worst thing yeah. that a company can do is tolerate an underperformer. So if you have a team mm. full of top performers and they see you giving special treatment to somebody who's not performing, not pulling their weight, now that top performer is no longer motivated to come in and perform at their best level because, oh, so-and-so isn't doing their work and that's tolerated. So now I'm going to slack off, which is going to ripple effect somebody else to slack off. And so if you have a team of people that are like the slackers, there may be one person who is the virus in your company. Yeah. And if you were to remove that person, or sometimes it's two people, 
that are just not allowing the company to grow, it's amazing how fast a company can start to grow when those one or two people that are holding everyone else back are immediately removed. It's it's very interesting to see where I've seen companies like double sales when in a month whenever they have removed one person from the office because the tension just eases. Everyone's able yeah. to work in a very nice manner. And if you're the owner of the company, you have the ability to do that. And firing people is not fun. Like it's not something fun to do, but sometimes it's necessary for the long-term growth of the company. And so, you know, depending on all of the different rules and regulations of your state, I'm not just telling people that you can just fire people for no sure. reason, but people not fitting yeah. into the culture is yeah. a reason for them to not work at your company. And I love how EOS yeah. puts it. Um, you know, there's, there's two different things there in EOS. There's the GWC. Does the person get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity? And is it the right person in the right seat? Because sometimes you have the right person and they're just in the wrong seat of the company. Like you have somebody that you brought in that you thought was going to be an absolutely amazing salesperson, but it actually turns out they're better at being a leasing person or they're better at doing maintenance or they're better at doing operations. But this person just fits so well in the company and they're willing to work their hardest and mm -hmm. you want to keep that person. That's the right person in the wrong seat. And sometimes you have the wrong person in the wrong seat and there is no right seat for them. You have to make yeah. a tough call and say, hey, this person is not helping our organization get to the goal. And when you remove the feelings out of it and you're looking at it from a culture standpoint of how you want the office to operate, it then becomes a little bit easier to step into that process because now it's not I'm feeling this way. It is, no, these are our core values or this is our company mission statement of where we're wanting to go and this person is not fitting into it. They can't be here. Yeah. Well, I think what you, what you just said kind of brought to me like sales uh, to me, great salespeople. One of the traits that they have is, is a mental toughness and a, an ability to focus. And I think a lot of, a lot of sales is, is a mental game. Like it is not, I'm not laying bricks and it's relying on just my hands doing the same thing over and over again. And if you're in an environment where you don't feel like you're you're able to be mentally sharp or you're able to be mentally bought in day in and day out that absolutely impacts performance it 100 yes. percent does if there is somebody that is negative every time you're bringing in a new deal that affects you versus Every time I bring in a new deal, I get to go ring a bell in the office and everyone celebrates. Like yep. it sounds cheesy, but like the the response that we get uh, matters and it affects mm -hmm. your ability to go and do your job and do it over and over again and conquer the goals that you have as an individual and as a company. And yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we both... I, I, the story that's coming to mind for me is uh, an experience my wife had at a previous job where there was just somebody that she worked with that she wasn't getting along great with. And it, I mean, it affected her, like it affected her mm -hmm. ability to do her job on a daily basis and her mindset around her work. And so yeah. I think that, um, I think that it matters a lot. And, and I've also, the other thing that came to mind for me was, you know, I've heard the expression like slow to hire, quick to fire. Oh, Obviously yeah. that sounds extreme, but the reality is like, if you let, somebody that is not um, benefiting your culture and is actually having a negative impact on your culture. If you let them stay around longer than you know that they should, like the far reaching effects for that from that um, are going to be pretty significant. Um, yeah. Kind of letting it, letting it sit just because you don't want to make a tough call can, um, can ultimately be, be worse uh, than, than not. Because, I mean, in, in all reality, we're talking about small business. We're talking about companies that have yeah. less than 10 employees working at them. It is obvious whenever you have somebody who is mm. not fitting in. And it is an absolutely uncomfortable situation because there are less than 10 of you in the office. And it is sometimes, not sometimes, we as human beings are not designed to love change. Like we are, our brains are actively wired to resist change because of all of the years of like 
evolution where it's like, oh, nope, I don't want anything to change. I know that that on that tree, if I eat that, it will kill me. I'm not going to change, right? And that looks, you know, (laughs) so um, we don't like change. So having to approach the idea of building a sales culture and whenever we build a sales culture and a team culture, it is going to cause friction because things are changing, but it is a lot of times, not a lot of times, I have seen this proved out over and over again. If you take the time to implement the culture and decide what is acceptable and what is not acceptable at your company, you go further faster. There may be a temporary setback where you do have to replace people and you do have to hold things together by tape and rubber bands for a few months and just really just hold it together while you find that right person. But once you find the right people to be in your company and you're attracting them towards your vision and where you want to go, you're going to run further faster and you're going to stay that way a lot longer because if your employees are happy coming into the office every single day, they are going to treat your customers better. And property management is a service. So if you have people that are not customer service focused and they are feeling crappy coming in every single day, your customers aren't going to want to work with them. That is going to lead to negative reviews, which is always a topic, right? If we have bad reviews, Mm -hmm. we're not attracting owners. It will lead to negative reviews. It will lead to people not wanting to work with your company. It will lead to low sales. It'll lead to high churn rate. So taking the time to really think about your company culture helps you to grow your company. And it has to be bigger than just my vision as the owner. It has to be including everybody into this and really bringing them in and rallying them around a central idea. And and then it comes back to what is important because it's not going to be the same to everybody. And trips to Six Flags may sound awful to people where they're like, I would never Mm. take all of my people to an amusement park. But time off may be what people earn, right? Like, hey, you can have an extra day of PTO. You can have two extra days of PTO. You can earn up to a week extra of paid time off. Whatever it is, like figure out what's important to your people. And that helps you to build that culture around where your company is trying to grow to. As you were talking, you know, the question that came to mind for me that I'd be really curious to get your thoughts on is, you know, obviously like my experience is coming from a very large sales organization. Like- Mm -hmm. The com- honestly, the sales team itself was almost as big, if not big, as the rest of the company. So obviously yeah. the sales culture like definitely permeated into all roles. But you know, for a lot of like to your point, like a lot of property management companies are, are relatively small in terms of employees. And so maybe yeah. you have one BDM or a BDM and a remote team member that are are your sales team. Like, I guess what advice would you have to a salesperson, or maybe the better question is like to uh, an owner of a property management company that has just one person in their sales department. Um, h- how how is it possible to have a, a sales culture for for a group that small? That's a great question, and and I see it happen over and over again where owners are like, I I don't know how to do it. I I don't know what to do. And I think that the biggest thing is honestly communication from the very beginning and staying in communication with your salesperson, especially now that we are in almost an entirely remote work culture. Um, You have to be in communication with your salespeople all the time, and you need to be talking to them about a little bit more than just how are your sales? Where's your pipeline at? Like get to know them a little bit and make them feel like they're part of the team. Invite them into the operations meetings. Let them know what your managers are struggling with. Let them know, um, you know, what needs to happen to make things grow faster. And I think the biggest thing is just making them feel like part of the team. Because in a lot of companies, there is only one salesperson. And I have been the only salesperson at a company and it gets lonely. Like it gets lonely sometimes yeah. because I I think that salespeople think in a little bit of a different way than operations people do. And so to be the only salesperson can be ostracizing. So as the owner, you're typically the manager, right? You are the owner of the company. You're a lot of times the director of operations and you're also the director of sales. It is your responsibility to step in and get to know that salesperson and what motivates them. Like, how can I motivate this person? Because it's not the same for everyone. Like for myself, I love money. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm very motivated by money, but I'm also motivated by the amount of value that I'm bringing to an organization and the amount of impact that we are creating as a company. Mm -hmm. So 
it's important for me to know what are the ripples of what I'm doing, right? Like what is the effects of what I'm yeah. doing and how is this helping to grow things, not just within the company, but at, at a bigger level. And so figuring that out in your sales person is important because that's how you help them to grow. And if you know your salesperson and you're having regular conversations with them, then they're going to be excited to come into work and they're going to be excited to sell for you because you are hiring somebody who's extremely talented, who could go and work anywhere. And I think that that's important yeah. to keep in mind as well is your salesperson could go somewhere else and make the same amount of money and that's just a reality, right? Like that could yeah. happen. And so you as the owner taking that responsibility to get to know your salesperson and knowing what motivates them. Um, there's a, a good book. And I think that it's, uh, I don't know if it's written by the same people that wrote like the five love languages, but there is the, the five languages of appreciation in business. I think that that's the title of it. It's a good book to read to figure out how do I talk to this person? Like what does motivate yeah. them? Because there is that misconception that it is always money for salespeople. And if I just throw them more money, then they're going to be happier. I have found that to be less true. Like most, most salespeople want to feel something and they want to feel like their work is yeah. making a difference. So bringing them into the team and, and making them feel that way, I think is a big step for building that culture when it's one BDM one owner and you guys are the sales team and and really getting to know that person and giving them space to be themselves give them space to yeah. to grow the sales because a lot of times too what i've seen is whenever we're hiring that salesperson it's the first one and the owner has been doing the sales up until that point so there is a sense of protectiveness around the sales of this is the way that i did it and so this is the right way to do it but taking a step back and allowing your salesperson the opportunity to figure out their own voice in it and their own way to do it, which may look different than the way that you did it, but allowing that that salesperson space to grow into the role and, and figure it out for themselves because that person may have a strength in video or social media or in-person networking where you as the owner had strength in inbound leads and you're converting at 65 percent well yeah you're the owner of the company you speak with complete confidence give that salesperson time to grow and give them the space to do that and don't um don't so much try to implement the way that you did it but give them the space to grow I think the communication aspect is is so 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 important, and you know, in my experience, having having managed salespeople, like I think one of the mm -hmm. most important questions that you can ask is like, "Hey, do you have everything that you need to do your job, or are you are you hitting roadblocks in your your day to day right now?" Because ultimately, like as is the case with any role, there are things that salespeople are naturally not gifted at or naturally do not want to do. And so, you know, if you are, if you find that your salesperson is saying to you, like, I'm getting so bogged down in this, that it's preventing me from being able to go out and hunt or to make all the calls I need, right? Like what you have to be able to identify is this person's unique gifting is closing. Like when right. they get in front of people, they are great people like them and trust them and want to buy from them. If that's the case, you need to be figuring out as a business owner, how do I get them in front of the most amount of people possible? Like if they're, if, if you are uh, asking your salesperson to do an insane amount of data entry, right. And they're the best at out talking to people like, all right, well maybe we need to figure out a way. We're not saying we're going to just, you know, salesperson, you never have to put notes into the CRM ever again. Like that's, that, that's maybe not a realistic uh, expectation, but like you want to make sure that you are uh, supporting your salesperson in a way that they're able to do what they love to do the most and, and they are most effective at. And so there's different things that, that get in the way. A lot of it tends to be admin related for salespeople in my experience. Uh, but you know, maybe it's maybe it's the owner handoff, right? Like once mm -hmm. the business development person has closed a deal, like how long are you asking them to be involved in the process from there? Are you asking them to do the owner onboarding? Because what they may tell you is, hey, I just 
I'm really good at closing deals. Like the, the detail oriented work of getting an owner set up, uh, within our software and getting all the necessary documents, like that's not my skill set, or that's taking up so much of my time that I feel like I'm not able to close as many deals as I want to like being attentive to that. Because if you're not asking the question, the, the salesperson is thinking it in their head and eventually what's going to happen is they're going to come to you and say, yeah, I, I found another opportunity. Well, why? Well, I just, you know, I, I really just want to be closing deals and I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not able to do that as much as I want here because I'm doing X, Y, Z, right? So if you're not asking the question, there's a story that is unfolding that you are completely unaware of, um, uh, happening in the background. So. Absolutely. So to, to bring us land the plane, as the analogy. Um, so as we're coming in to land the plane on this episode, I want us to talk to some of the practical starting points to work through. Um, I want to approach this maybe from two different ways. So for the owner, and then if you're the BDM and you're listening to this episode and you're thinking, wow, I wish my company had some sales culture. I want to speak a little bit to that in, in just a moment. So as the owner Ben, what are what are some practical ways that the owner of a company can start to uh, build a sales culture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the first thing, and very s- simply put, like just being very clear on what your ultimate goal is. Right? It all it all comes back to that. And if you don't know, it, it's kind of that you know, what's your why? Like, what what are we mm-hmm. ultimately trying to get to? Like, if you don't know where the endpoint is, you're not going to know how to how to chart a path to get there. Uh, you're just going to be sort of aimlessly wandering. And so as, as a business owner, if you have hired a salesperson or if you haven't hired a salesperson, like I would just start with that, with that question. Um, but then also, you know, kind of ask yourself, like if I was a salesperson working at my company, like what would I want the experience to be like? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that, when you put yourself in somebody's shoes, it makes it a lot easier to think about what what best case is, right? Like, how would I want to be treated as a salesperson? Well, I can tell you that I would want to be compensated well for for the results uh, that I that I bring in. I would want to have the freedom to, um, you know, kind of go about my strategy in a certain way or, you know, not have somebody looking over my shoulder at every step of the way. Nobody likes to be micromanaged. Um, you know, think through some of those things that, you know, it's helpful if you're doing it before you've hired a salesperson, but even if you already have a salesperson, I think the conversation then becomes is I would sit down with your salesperson and be like, Hey, what do you like about your job? What do you not yep. like about your job? Like, why, are, why did you come work here? What, what has the experience been like? Like people value being asked their opinions. And Mm -hmm. ultimately, I think if you're asking the question, it goes back to that communication thing. If you're asking the question um, and giving room for honesty, right? Like (laughs) that's an important caveat. People have to feel uh, the psychological safety to be honest with you about how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, Asking and getting getting a clearer picture of what their experience is like is ultimately going to be helpful. And then even to take it a step further, I would talk to everyone in your organization about, you know, the sales side of things like, yep. hey, you know, just and maybe you're not asking it this directly, but like, hey, do you like, does it fire you up when, we, when we're, we're bringing in new business like or when we're growing or? you know, you're, you're going to get one of two answers. Yeah. Like, I love it. It's awesome. Like, I feel like I'm a part of something or, you know, oh, yeah. Like whenever the salesperson brings new business in, it's, I just kind of, I know that there's a lot of work in store for me. Right. And so yep. I think as a leader getting a pulse on where things currently stand, uh, it's almost like, you know, it's kind of a SWOT analysis of like, Hey, what, what's going well? what's not going well, what are our opportunities, uh, that sort of thing, I think, I think is yeah. a good, is a good starting point. But I, I'm curious from, from your standpoint, Kristen, like for that person that hasn't hired a salesperson yet, and is maybe early stages of wanting to do that, like h- how would you recommend that they go about that from a practical standpoint? 
Yeah, I think that the the first thing that should happen is you should write down a list of every single thing that you want your salesperson to be responsible for. And yeah. write that down and really think about who you are trying to hire for that role. And if this person does need to, because that's just where the company is at, needs to have some ability for data entry, or they need to have some ability to do leasing, or they need to stay with the client longer, it's important that you really think about what that is going to look like. And then my recommendation is always to run that by someone else. Mm -hmm. What I love about the property management industry is we're, I feel like we're a pretty close knit group of people, right? A lot of, it's kind of like everybody knows everybody. It's like a small town. Um, so, you know, other people who have hired uh, business development managers before take your list and run it by them and say, Hey, what do you think about this? It, there are plenty of professional uh, professionals out there that will help you to hire a BDM. But if you're going to take this on, on your own, be very clear about what you want from the beginning and be bold enough to communicate that during the hiring process. This is mm -hmm. what I want you to do because what it comes down to at the end when there is BDM turnover is a misalignment in expectations where the BDM was coming in expecting to do one thing and then they had 10 other things thrown on their plate. Hey, after you make the sale, I need you to enter everything into Appfolio. I need you to stick with the client until the property is leased. I need you to um, you know, call the client whenever there's issues with them and make sure that you're working in on retention. Those things aren't communicated during the interview process. Those things come afterwards. And that causes a lot of frustration for a BDM because they're like, I thought I was just being brought in to sell doors. And now you're wanting me to do all of these other things. If you're honest about that at the beginning, the BDM can go in with clear expectations. So it all starts with your list of what you want the BDM to do and how long you want them to be in the process after they sign the door. If you're clear about that from the beginning, it makes it much easier to hire because you know who you need to hire. And hiring the right person can be the difference between doubling the size of your company and churning 55% of the doors that you're already managing, right? So making sure that you sit down and think about what do I want this person to be doing and being very clear on that, I think is the first step that anyone should take whenever you're thinking about your, your culture and you're thinking about hiring a salesperson. Yeah. I, it, just to echo a point that, that you're making, like ultimately having that clarity of what the expectations are that is such an important part of the type of person you are going to hire, right? Mm -hmm. Because to say like, I, I'm just, I'm looking for a good salesperson. Like th that is a very, very broad net. Uh, and, yeah. and it's hard to define, honestly. So, you know, if you're saying I want this person Yes, they're going to they're going to be selling, but I'm going to have them doing these other things too that maybe tend to be more detail oriented. Like that very much determines the type of salesperson you mm -hmm. should be hiring. Because I've worked with enough salespeople, you've worked with enough salespeople to know that not every salesperson is detail oriented. And nope, and it's not in me. In fact, I would if say you if you needed a salesperson <laughs> that needed to be detail oriented, it's not me. It is not me. Yep. <laughs> Right. So like if you, if you are if in your expectation, you're very clear that, no, this is what I want this person to be doing. Like this is how they are going to spend their day. That ultimately is going to help you determine the type of person that you're looking for. And it's going to right. help you from avoiding making a big mistake where your expectation is, is, oh, this person should be able to do these 10 things. And in reality, that salesperson's expectation is, is I really just need to be doing these three things. Like that's, that's how I see it. Um, and you have to be able to communicate it well. Otherwise, you're going to end up in a big mess and regretting making a hire that <laughs> you know you probably shouldn't have made or or you should have approached differently. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So then, now on the flip side of that, right? If you are the BDM and you're listening to this episode, first of all, thank you for sticking with us all the way to the end of this episode. Yeah. I hope that you took away some nuggets as well as what you could have in your company. And so. I think that for for the BDM, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, there's something just missing and and I really am 
maybe I'm doing too much or this, this culture is weird. I don't know if I'm fitting in. Um, an exercise that I liked to run with BDMs is actually one that comes from EOS, and that's a delegate and elevate exercise. You can Google that, and it will bring up this T chart. And in the top left-hand corner, it says things that you love and that you're great at. In the top right-hand corner, it says things that you like and you're good at. In the bottom left-hand corner, it says things that you don't like, but you're good at. And the bottom right head quarter is things that you don't like and things that you do not like that you're not good at. And typically anything that falls below that line takes you twice the amount of time to do as a person who that falls on the upper half of their quadrant. So I think that by sitting down and listing out all of the things that you have to do during the day and then segmenting them into one of these four categories gives you something to go in and talk to your owner or your manager about of, hey, these are the things that I'm really good at and these are the things that I really like doing. And if you free up my time or allow me to focus Mm. on these things, I could double my sales. And the reason that I know that is because here's like, here's what I've done with the amount of hours that I've been able to do that. And these things that fall below the line, here's how many hours it takes me to do them because I promise you those things that fall below the line take you a long time to do like data entry god it used to take me hours to do it and i it was hard and i would put it off and then it would affect the other part of the things that i was doing so having an a something tangible that you can walk in and start to open this conversation with the owner of your company or your manager gives you a good jumping off point because if you just walk in and you say you know what boss i just feel like this sucks and I feel it, it. You're saying those things like that word. I nope. feel, I feel like this. I feel like that. I mean, I want to respect your feelings, but at the same time, your feelings don't really equate into dollars, which is how we want to make sure that we're going to talk to somebody about making a change here and coming in and saying, if you allow me to focus on these six things, I can double the amount of sales that I'm doing. That has a lot more conversation than coming in and it a lot of times comes across as complaining, right? I, You're Mm -hmm. complaining about your job. So as the BDM, if you're wanting to approach this conversation, find some find some statistics, right? Get yourself a delegate and elevate and really list out every single thing that you do during the week from coming into the office in the morning. Hopefully that doesn't fall in don't like and not good at, but coming into the (laughs) office in the morning down to like answering phone calls and and data entry into your CRM and and things like that. You know, make sure that you list everything on there and then be reasonable about where those fall, right? You may not like entering notes into your CRM, but I'm sorry, that's not something you could ever get rid of. Um, But be reasonable about where those things fall and then start that conversation from a point of data, right? Start it from, Mm. this is what I'm good at. This is where I want to be at. And if I can do this, I can be more productive. Um, Ben, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that that's really good. I mean, it, it's it's very helpful to have that kind of self-reflection of even just putting that down on paper. Like, I think most of us could kind of walk through that ex- exercise in our minds, but it's helpful to write it down mm-hmm. because before you even take it to a manager or an owner, like there may be some things that you're able to sort out on your own that are going to help you do your job better. I mean... Yeah. If if what you love and are best at is talking to people and winning hearts and minds, like then between the hours of, you know, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., like that's all you should be focused on. Right. Like Mm -hmm. I think that there's just some simple ways that that good salespeople are able to play to their own strengths and be more effective. Um, The other thing that came to mind for me, kind of back to what we were talking about with with buy in is the importance of like being present and connected to the rest of the organization. Like Mm. a lot of times a salesperson, honestly, you should be out and about talking to people. You should be meeting with people, right? But you still need to build those relationships with the people that ultimately are going to be onboarding these deals that you close and taking care of these owners and their eventual tenants. Like, get an understanding of what what your team wants to see what are what are the things that matter to them what are the things that slow them down in doing their jobs because one it helps a lot to show that you care i mean uh, i don't think I, i'll be saying anything too controversial to say that 
a lot of people that aren't in sales have a lot of like strong opinions about people that are in sales. And so just showing that like you care about the other people that you're working alongside and that, and knowing that your work impacts them, mm -hmm. that is going to show a level of uh, commitment to your, your coworkers that ultimately will make them feel better about what you're doing. It'll be easier for them to celebrate what you're doing. If they know, Hey, Kristen is really, she's, she's really bought in. Like she, she understands what makes my job hard, what makes my job mm -hmm. easier. And I can tell that she's making an effort to, um, you know, create a better experience for me as a coworker versus yep. I'm the salesperson that maybe pops into the office an hour a week and I don't really talk to anyone and they just have to deal with, you know, all the deals that I sign, right? Like it matters to build those relationships uh, within your company because ultimately those pe you need those people to be successful too. Um, yep. You know, you're not going to be able to uh, continue to get paid well and win deals if everything that you're signing is churning out, right? Like mm -hmm. you need to make sure that ultimately your team is successful and, and it, it matters. It, 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 it has an impact on their mentality about their, their day to day as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So rounding us out, sales culture is important. Company culture is important. If you have not put thought into what that looks like for your company, we highly recommend that you sit down, take maybe an hour a week until you figure it out and write out where you want your company to grow to and how you are going to get there. I love it. Kristen, this is, this is, we're only a few episodes in, but this is already a favorite of mine. This was great. Yeah. I think we may say that about everyone. I think we're just going to keep continuing to crush it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. This one is we my favorite also. We certainly won't get to the end of one and be like, this one was not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope not. Uh, if, if that's the case, then things have gone horribly wrong. But oh, uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We're grateful uh, that you tuned in and we will see you next time.